So uh, you have to bear with my uh, lack of uh, French. Uh, wanted to, I'm very excited to be here. Cubit France is our first office in Europe. Uh, so we're really excited about coming into the French market. We think it's a really exciting space. We think you're really exciting retailers and businesses and travel companies to work with. And so it's, it's fantastic to see so many of you here. I, um, I understand also it's the second day uh, after you've launched your sales. So I hope everybody's relaxed, no, no emergency meetings, or uh, thank you for making it out here this morning. We hope this morning is an is a informative day, so you have an opportunity to learn a little about some of the trends that we're seeing in the market. So I'm, the, uh, I'm founder and CEO of Qubit. I started the business uh, four years ago with three of my colleagues from Google. I was fortunate enough to uh, be at Google for five years to watch it grow from about 2,000 people, and I left when it was about 30,000 people. Uh, at one point, I was interviewing about 60 people a week to, uh, to, to fill those sort of those roles. It was actually a pretty, uh, it was a pretty interesting experience. And I spent a lot of time with Google in France here, actually, working with the French team. And so my, my role at Google, I was very involved with building uh, products to improve our advertisers' efficiency. So Emre and I, my co-founder, the CTO of Qubit, we spent our time working on the AdWords platform. Anybody here familiar with the AdWords platform? A couple. So it's the Google advertising system. We built some of the, the, the modeling within that platform to allow businesses to plan for how they could spend and invest their money in Google to get sales. And uh, that product was really a big data challenge. We were doing this before the term big data really existed. We were literally processing billions of search queries a day, looking for patterns in those queries, and then enabling our, our you know, Google's customers to use that information to buy traffic. And then I spent my last two years at Google working on uh, products to help improve conversion rates. I got very involved with the Google Analytics team and was really working on a lot of the features in uh, Google Analytics that are, are now out today. And as part of this journey at Google and um, going from the advertising side to the analytics side, I really caught the bug, the passion for e-commerce and for getting into understanding how to make e-commerce work better. And so I actually you know, started with, uh, with one of the co-founders, a business to be an e-commerce company first, selling sports goods. But we were constantly outbid by Amazon. That made us think, well, how do we compete with Amazon? Let's try and create more personalization on the website. So we built personalization into the site. We saw the results. And we thought, this is interesting. This is actually something that many businesses could benefit from. So we set out to build a website optimization application suite. And so what we do is we bring together visitor analytics, A-B testing, personalization, and business intelligence into a single product, into a single suite. And really, these are the four key ingredients that we see e-commerce businesses really benefiting from. These are the ingredients that help you understand your customer, understand the opportunities, be able to test changes to your site, and then run those changes as personalization to those customers when you know it's going to have a positive impact. So we brought these four disciplines together into a single application suite. And as part of that, you know, what we've actually been recognized as doing this, uh, it's a study that Forrester recently did. And it's a non-sponsored study. They just wrote about interesting companies transforming how businesses can use data. They picked Qubit out as a company alongside Rich Relevance, Bloom Reach, Agile One, that's really sort of looking at data very differently and allowing customers to really sort of take advantage of information and data in a way that goes way beyond traditional reporting and analytics does today. So we're really excited about getting recognized there. And so what we've really worked with, the type of businesses that we've been working with over the last couple of years, have been a mix between luxury fashion brands like Jimmy Choo and Bell Staff to fast fashion brands like Topshop and Uniqlo, all the way through to uh, travel companies like Eurostar, and to even uh, manufacturing companies like Mil, who sell vacuum cleaners and dishwashers. You know, we've been working across all these different areas and providing personalization into the heart of these businesses, but very focused on improving transactional business models. You know, there, there, there are a couple of companies out there that look at a lot of uh, solutions for every type of site. We're very focused on improving transactional business models. 
So, how can you understand the trends of consumers today? And why has personalization and A-B testing become such an important thing for us today as marketers? Really, what we live in is what we call the Facebook, Google, and Apple generation. And this means that we're in a world where there are literally three companies that every customer is experiencing daily. Everybody's on Facebook, everybody's searching on Google or using Gmail, everybody has some type of Apple product in their life. So the expectations that these companies create are very high. Facebook, for instance, changes their site about three times a year. They change the site three times a year. An average retailer will make a major change to their site on average about once every three years. So there's a very, very big difference between the amount of time people change, uh, the amount of time Facebook raises the expectation for experience and the amount of times that these customers then come to your businesses and are like, why can't I search like this? Or why that neat little JavaScript thing on Facebook doesn't seem to exist here? And that raises the expectation. I, I you know, so, saw this most dramatically with search. You know, Google created an expectation that every retail site should have fantastic search because that's what Google did for the web. And so we have to understand that this is driving a serious change in consumer behavior. The other thing that we sort of acknowledge is the fact that many visitors to your site come there once and will never come back again. And a lot of businesses track visit conversion as a main metric. We find that metric is pretty much getting to be quite old now. And we're looking much more about the visitor, understanding the fact that no customer really ever comes to your site and buys on a first visit. Most of the purchases are considered purchase paths. And therefore, you know, the number for visitors uh, conversion rate is higher than the number for visit conversion. But ultimately, we still see 93% of visitors not buying from the site. And when we delve into this a little bit deeper, we actually looked um, at a particular vertical, travel. Any travel companies here today? Oh, okay. So travel is particularly pronounced where it's actually 22 visits to a site before purchase. And so you have to understand that every visit to another site is a chance that you've lost that customer. So the importance of creating the best possible experience in those visits when you're on your site is critical. And how many, how many people here use Chrome out of interest? Chrome is a browser, Google Chrome, couple. So Google Chrome has put the search box into the browser box. That's the equivalent of your competitor is standing at the till, taking your customers as they're about to purchase. You know, all you have to do is create a little bit of a frustrating experience and that customer will go and search and go search and go back onto Google and go back to potentially one of your competitors. So the importance for experience has never been greater. Another metric that we really focus on, and this is something that I was pretty surprised by when we did this analysis. We looked at over the 200 million visitors that our platform is uh, personalizing and tracking across our 100 customers. We found that on average 0.03% of visitors made up more than 30% of revenue. So that's a very, very small. In many cases, if your site has a million visitors, that represents a couple of thousand visitors that make up 30% of your revenue. And this cohort of customers, they are your most valuable customers. These are the customers that bring you your revenues that you depend on for growth and for stability in the business. And the most important thing is to make sure you continue to retain these customers and create loyalty and ensure that you find new customers who can join this cohort. Because businesses um, that have sort of changed their growth models have focused often too much on the low value visitors as a priority because there are more of them and they've forgotten about the high value visitors that are almost like a, what we say in English, a needle in the haystack. They're quite hard to find within your data. But these are a very, very important visitor group that makes up a significant revenue base for you. And I think it would be, uh, we have to acknowledge now the impact the web is having on all types of commerce. It's not just web e-commerce, which is a two and a half trillion dollar global industry today. But Deloitte recently came out with a study that said 84% of every purchase in a store is influenced by digital device in that journey. 
And that works out to about 50% of physical revenue commerce is actually influenced by website behavior. So what the website is doing, and I'm talking about mobile, tablet, desktop, you know, what the website journey is doing is actually driving almost $12 trillion plus in revenue globally. So the web business now will become pretty much one of the most important aspects of a company because it's so influential on the purchase path, whether you're a pure play or multi-channel business. And how many people here are multi-channel business? Do you have stores, physical stores? There are a couple. No. And so we're also going to see some very other interesting trends starting to emerge as well. So how do you, how do you sort of get ahead? How do you compete in this sort of world where, where these changes are happening? And I wanted to reflect on a, on a couple of businesses that are doing some very interesting elements around these sort of big changes we're seeing in commerce. Now, what we're really looking at here is how do you watch, listen, and learn about your customers as you, uh, as you see these changes occurring. And so Macy's uh, is an American department store. They have 840 stores across the states. And they've turned 500 of their, yes, 500 of their stores into distribution centers. So they will actually pick, pack, and deliver the e-commerce order from that store, and they will aim to deliver it same day. So they've created in their system the ability for an order to come in and be placed at the right store automatically and then get delivered. So the same shop assistant is packing the shelf, is also packing the boxes to send for e-commerce customers. And so what we're seeing is a rapid evolution in the concept of physical and digital coming together. And it's creating an inc a very interesting proposition around delivery and logistics. And so we're going to start to see more of these types of innovations. Another innovation I was particularly um, interested by was actually Nordstrom, another American department store that um, has actually incentivized their sales team. So they've actually made an operational change to their business. They've incentivized their sales team to actually do sales on iPads for their online business. So when a customer comes in, they, they talk to the customer about buying online, they get paid a commission, so they're actually getting paid as if they made the sale in the store, but they're driving the customer online. It creates great loyalty and great retention because then you've captured the email address and you can start to have a conversation with that customer after they left the store. And so you know, one of the issues that this store was uh, overcoming early on in its days is that their shop assistants would actually blank out a special discount code on the receipts for customers that then bought online. Because that, that, the sales team didn't want to lose their commission. So this is a, how a businesses are actually changing operationally how they work around the change in consumer behavior. So really what we call this philosophy is real-time retailing. It's all about how do I understand my customer wherever they are, whatever device, in real time, and how do I talk? How do I have the conversation? How do I move beyond the site change every three years? And how do I move into the site change every day? And how do I create a much more real-time understanding of my user base? And so what we see as a starting point, a critical starting point, it, it's about knowing your customer. It's about being able to create the customer personas and the profiles that are relevant to your business. And so you know anything from a sofa surfer, a person who sits on the sofa and buys while watching TV, through to your most loyal customer, through to a person who likes to put things in the basket all the time and not buy. You know, we all have these different personas of customers. And you know, what we've seen as a best practice is businesses that operate sort of around 20 different persona types. And that's really around things like the stage of the journey they're in and sort of behavioral characteristics that you can create a change around for your business. And you know, running through a couple of examples of, of, of what some of our customers have been doing, I think Jimmy Choo, a you know, luxury fashion brand, their objective is to create the equivalent luxurious experience that you would have in one of their stores. They want to create it online. And so what they did is they actually managed a real-time crisis. So in New York, over the uh, sort of January, February, March, there was horrific cold weather. They called it the polar vortex. Americans like to be very dramatic. And what they did was they had such an interruption to their delivery, they were able to just target 
New York customers who had made a purchase. And what they did was able to actually tell that customer, there's going to be an interruption with your delivery. And so they were actually able to communicate just with the New York customer. Now, typically, a business would, would not be able to surface this message, or they would surface this message to everyone. So somebody in LA, where it's perfectly warm, beautiful, would see some weather, notice about severe weather in New York. And you just don't need to show that. And this is a really good example of real-time retailing crisis management. Another example, again, using the weather, it's a very powerful trigger for purchase behavior. Burton in the UK was actually able to match weather forecasts, the location of the user down to their down to city level, and products that match that weather forecast. And we're able to actually drive sales by 12% on their homepage by showing customers that information in real time. And it created a more interesting, engaging editorial around the weather forecast and the product that they have. And so again, it gave customers something exciting, something relevant, something in real time. Another one of our customers, and this is an example of what Farfetch said, you know, this is something where customers are using the assets that they already have. You know, they, Farfetch discovered that there was a customer group, a large customer group, that would look at many page views, had visited but never purchased. And they were clearly getting lost around the site. And what they realized was that if they could just surface to those lost customers an instruction on how to purchase from their site, because they're a boutique model, it's not your normal retail model, they needed to explain that. And so what they did, they were able to surface to those lost customers about how to read, how to shop the site. And just from surfacing that information to this lost group of users, they were able to drive sales by 17%. And they were using an existing asset. It literally took them minutes to set this up, led to a very, very big jump in sales, millions of dollars, for a very, very uh, important segment of lost customers. And another example that is about listening to your customers in real time. Something that Topshop did, Topshop relaunched their homepage. It was a very, very big change from their original homepage. And what they did was it actually accidentally made the search box pretty hard to find. And so what they were able to see in real time were users saying, love the new homepage, can't find the search box. And so what they'd done is they created a really nice design. The design team had gone to you know, real efforts to make it look amazing, but it was so amazing, it was so hard to find. And so what this enabled them to do within that same day was change the search box to something that was more clear. They could A-B test that, different version, and that drove sales from their new page by 6%. And so, you know, that was really critical for them because it, typically they would have made that change and not been aware that they'd actually caused a downlift in sales because they'd removed a critical element of the page. So looking at how you use different techniques to move into real-time retailing, it's really about focusing on the join of quantitative data with qualitative data. The quantitative data it's about going in and looking at information far beyond what we look at normally today. Looking at things like brands and colors and ratings and category of products. Looking against th that data against critical metrics to run your business by and then combining it with what your customers actually think and are doing on the site. And so the way these two work together is you have lots of structured information from all your users and then a small sample of users that leave feedback. And those two together do a very good makeup of your customer base and what they're thinking. And combining that qualitative and quantitative analytics and information with the ability to actually understand how to launch changes quickly. And what we've been very focused on, you'll see this later in the demo from Ernest, is we've been very focused on creating ways for our customers to launch faster, to be more real-time. And what we launched in the latest version of our A-B testing and personalization system deliver was templates that allow you to start from about 65 predetermined best practices, systems, ones that we know really work for customers, and be able to start from that and then brand them to your own business and then save those templates for you to reuse in another period, another sale period. And then what we're focused on 
over and over and over again is the importance of statistics, the importance of measurement, and actually checking the, the changes you make to your site are going to drive a positive impact on your revenue. So it's not about being a gut feel. It's about actually saying, I have a hypothesis, I'm going to make a change, and I'm going to see the impact of that in terms of uplifts or downlifts. And that, makes, that helps me make a decision that I know is going to drive value for the company. It helps you be more adventurous with what you do, but in a much safer environment, which is a powerful combination. So finally, just to conclude, I think the sort of three key areas that we've seen customers really uh, move forward with is really about rethinking the customer journey. It's about thinking about the customer journey no longer as how you think about it as marketers, which is mobile, tablet, online, offline. Your customers think about your brand, and they think about where you're, they're accessing your brand, irregardless of whether it's a mobile tablet. They want a seamless experience across every touch point. So it's about thinking like your customer. The second area is about stopping the guesswork and using analytics, and truly integrating analytics into the core of your business. So you're making most of your decisions from a, from a data-driven perspective. And the third, and again, really dear to our heart at Qubit, is about looking at the uh, activating that data and not putting the data into a dead end, into Excel or PowerPoint or PDF and sending it around. It's about taking that data and making it active in real time and actually serving something new for your customers to drive sales. So that was a quick look at the market, a quick look at some of uh, how we view the world. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you. Thank you.